Greetings, Earthlings. Today we're going to take a look at the um, frequency multiplier board for this Heathkit uh, frequency counter and ask the question, did it ever work? Um, now, when you bought the kit, it came with an extender card, which would let you test the uh, these boards the vertical boards in it uh, in in place by raising them up above the top of the uh, case. That board, of course, is long gone, but I have figured out how to test it outside the case. It's not that hard, although it looks a mess, perhaps. It needs uh, plus and minus 16 volts, and that comes from this power supply here. The green is plus, the blue is minus. It needs 5 volts, that's coming from this power supply here. It needs the jumpers for the multiplier set to something, so I've jumpered them here to um, times 10. And it needs an input signal, and the input signal is coming from here, and that's a square wave that goes between 3 and 4 volts. Uh, it's 1 volt peak to peak with a 3 volt DC offset. Um, so we'll take a look at this. Let me uh, turn on the oscilloscope and uh, power things on here. And let's see. There, I said, there's my input signal. Well, it's about 10 kilohertz. Okay. You can see it's about 3 to 4 volts. Um, 1 volt per division here, so 1, 2, 3, then that's 4. Uh, and it's not quite warmed up yet, but it's about 3 to 4. All right, calling that close enough. Um, and then we follow it through and, and look at the output, and of course there's nothing on the output. So we've got a problem here. Now I've gone through and looked at a number of things here. There are some things I don't like, some things I question. Uh, first of all, um, there's a voltage here which it says should be, I think, 8.5, and it's 9. Point, it measures at 9.62, which is you know more than 10% out of spec, so that could be an issue. Um, but if we look, well, let's go to the output. Let's see. I mean, I'll, I'll look at this. Um, here's the output. That is pin, what? Pin 6, but I was testing it at the connector. Uh, let's look at pin 2, which is the input to that gate, and see what it looks like. And that's IC509, which is this guy right here. So pin 2. Oop. Oop. I probably just fried it. Now there's some little spikies there. I I don't know how well these show up, but um, from four volts down to about three point, I guess that's three point four. There's a little spike at you know that says ninety five k, which is close to 100k, which is 10 times the input, because the input was, again, uh, the input was, I said the input was, what happened to the, oh, that's the output, uh, the input's over here. The input was 9.5k, okay, I like a little closer to 10, please, just to make things look nicer, okay, 10.01 on the input, and, uh, Oop. 
100.1 on the output. So yes, the uh, it's working up until up until that gate. It looks like. So there's there's two things here. One that gate could be bad, but the other thing is that there's a signal to turn that gate on, which uh, which is supposed to be between three and four volts. Plus three volts locked. Plus four volts unlocked. Okay. And if we look at that, that's pin 5 of this same chip. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 3.66 volts. Well, it's right in the middle. So, now looking at the circuit, um, that actually indicates locked, I believe, because what we have is there's a 100 ohm pull-up resistor to plus 5 volts, and then when it's locked, it gets pulled down through a, what is that, 270 ohm resistor uh, pulled down to ground when it's locked. Uh, and that would give as a voltage divider, about 3.6 volts. So, to get this between 3 and 4 volts, there really needs to be a 400 ohm, approximately 400 ohm resistor from that point to ground. And it's just not here. I don't have a 400 ohm resistor, but I have a 470 ohm resistor. So we're going to try that. I'm going to turn this off while I insert that. So if I go between pins 5 and 7, 5 being that input and 7 being ground on that chip. Um, I'll, uh, I should get something closer to, uh, you know, 3 to 4 volts. So we'll power it back on. And again, looking at pin 5, yeah, you can see that's now 3.15 volts. So that, that, looks, that looks more correct. That says locked, certainly within 10%. Um, within 5%, eh? eh? Let's uh, go back to pin, let's see, well, let's see if that made the output appear. Oh, for, on the oscilloscope. No, that's still nothing. It's at one, two, three point, about 3.5 volts just sitting there. Well, one other thing I can check, this gate has an inverting and a non-inverting output. The, what it's using for this is the inverting output. If I look at the non-inverting output, and that's pin one, so we saw pin 2 was the input, and we saw some little spikies there, right? Pin 1 should be the same thing. Yeah, and it is. It's just a buffered version of that same, uh, of that same pulse. So that says it's looking like um, this chip is bad. Now that is IC509. An MC1023P. Where in the world am I going to find one of those? Those things are super obsolete ECL gates. You can't get them at mouse or digit key or oh wait. Here's three of them here. So we'll try that. Um, try one of those. Um, well, I'm taking the tape off. I'm going to talk. I'll, I'll switch the power off. Talk about a couple of other issues here with this circuit. So there's a 7400 right here. Uh, that's IC508. It's a quad, quad two input NAND gate. Okay, 7400, standard, standard chip. Um, one of the gates, no, yes, one of them is used as a NAND. The other three are used as simply inverters. On those that are used as inverters, two of them have the other pin 
pulled up to plus 5. The third one has that pin not connected. That makes no sense at all. Um, first of all, you know, if you just want to run it as an inverter, those, those input pins are adjacent. You can just connect them together. You don't need to pull it to plus 5. If you pull it to plus 5, it ought to be through a current limiting resistor, not directly to plus 5. Now, it is TTL, and, and TTL gates will float high, uh, but you lose noise immunity and stuff. And should I choose to replace, or try, let's say, try to replace that gate with something like a 74HCT00, which is a CMOS version of that chip, um, that's not going to work because CMOS does not float high. Why would I want to do that? Well, maybe that's all I have, or um, maybe I, I want to. I think it needs more output drive because the the uh, TTL chips have sort of a weak pull-up resistor uh, for the high output, whereas the CMOS chips have a, uh, a effect in there, a field effect transistor, which can actually drive more current than the, uh, than the TTL wimpy resistor. All right, pulling that out. Another issue, well, this one looks okay, but a number of these chips, actually, I'm gonna pull out that 7400 to show this and hopefully you'll be able to see it. So I mentioned before that they don't use sockets, they use these funky pins. Um, and if I wanted to replace them with normal, proper sockets, I mean, I'd use high reliability machine sockets, uh, that one would be okay. But here, look at this one. It's got a resistor under it. So I couldn't put a socket there because the resistor would be in the way of the socket. And there, There's more than one like that. There's a bunch of them. And I just think that's kind of amateur. You know, I don't know what Heathkit was thinking. Whoever designed it, I mean, you know, I would think that the guy who designed it was more or less a pro. The guys who put it together are, 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 are you know, amateurs to some extent. And, and it needs to be bulletproof for them. Um, and that's not right. Seeing pin one go in there wonky. So that's, this is, see, I don't, I do not like these socket pins. They don't seem reliable to me. And it's easy to kind of miss. Okay. Look, uh, review close. Okay, I think that's okay. Um, what did I do with my, ah, here. Here is my uh, IC509, the MC1023P. I've got it in a ancient Radio Shack inserter here to straighten the pins out. And I will attempt to install it. This doesn't really work very well either if it doesn't have a socket to sit down on. I gotta pull that out. Check my pins. Okay. Yeah. Marginal. It's tilted. It's it's tilted.
Okay, that looks good. So I'm going to do two things. I mean, I'm, I've put that chip in, but also I'm going to jumper. So on this 7400, uh, right there, spin one and two. I'm going to jumper those because spin two is the not connected one. So there's pin one, there's pin two. I've got a, just a little jumper here. Jumper those. And whoops. And I'm going to take my 470 ohm resistor and I'm going to put it in from pins five to seven on this chip here. Probably good enough. Let's see if that did it. Powering on. Powering on. Three point one five. Okay, we're locked. Uh, where's my oscilloscope oh, probe? It's down here. We'll look at the output. I see nothing. Oh, there. There it is. You see that? So there's about 3.4, 3.5 volts. There's a little bitty spike up there, just above 4 volts. Another one over here, which did not appear with that uh, old chip. So that has apparently resolved the problem. There's the input again, and it's not triggered because the trigger level is different. Okay, there's the negative going spike. There's, there's my output. Turn that up. Intensity-wise, maybe you see it a little better. Um, yeah, okay. So that appears to have fixed the board. Now, I'll get, I'll get those mods made permanent and then we'll put it in. Uh, I mentioned previously that, uh, I think I mentioned in the previous video, that I needed a uh, printed manual to, uh, to set the adjustment on the input board. And I've got one of those now. And so uh, we'll run it through its adjustments and see if we can't get it calibrated. Okay, and here is the setup. Uh, Multiplier board's back in. Here's the input board. I'm set up to uh, do the adjustment on the input board. So, input calibration says, use the alignment tool and adjust control R418 on the input circuit board until the display shows random numbers. The test cable should not be connected at this time. Okay, fine, fine, okay. And those are random numbers. Okay, so then slowly turn R418 clockwise until the display is all zeros. If I can get this in there. Oh! That's darn close. Uh, the least significant digit may vary between 1 and 0. Okay. If an accurate voltmeter is available, perform the following three steps. Connect the voltmeter leads between the chassis and pin 1 of IC402. That's where it's connected. Adjust control for an R418 uh, for an indication of 3.45 volts on the voltmeter. Okay. Well, we're at 3.72 right now. 
So we're pretty close. We want 3.45. I think I'm turning it. I think I'm turning it. I'm trying to turn it. Do I need a different adjustment tool? The problem is that uh, that coax connector's in the way. Ah, here we go. Now we're getting somewhere. Three point four five. Mm. Close enough. All right. And showing one count. I don't know why. Okay. And let's see if it's now fully functional. I have 100 kilohertz here. I'm going to go into the uh, AC input. I'm on 100 milliseconds and times 1. And enabling the output. 100.00 kilohertz. That's pretty good. Okay. If I go one second, 100,000 hertz. Okay. And one, and one. Well, we still haven't adjusted the uh, time base there. Okay, let's see if times 10 works. Did we determine that times 10 worked at 100 kilohertz? Because uh, it's not working now. <laughs> uh, let me go to 10 kilohertz and see what happens. No, that's the wrong way. There's 10 kilohertz. Still nothing. All right, so we've still got a problem with the uh, with the multiplier board apparently. Um, sigh, but I should be able to adjust the time base in any case. Right, uh, adjustment, uh, time base. Um, what I've got, and I, I can't move it into the screen because I'd have to unplug it, and if I unplug it, that's a bad thing. What I've got is an oven-controlled crystal oscillator operating at 10 megahertz and synced to, um, uh, GPS signal. So that's putting out, um, I'm going to call that, you know, 10 megahertz. Uh, now the, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. This claims, you know, plus or minus one ppm, which would be one part per million or this digit here. It's within two, but we can get it closer, I think. Okay, I'm gonna leave it that way for about half an hour or so and see if it holds steady. I'll make final adjustments when, uh, when it's fully back in the case. Right, this is not holding the heat in, so that could affect the operation as well. All right, well, I took the multiplier card out and checked it again. Uh, it did seem to be acting up a bit, so I replaced one transistor. It works now, again, out of circuit. But I think I've discovered something else, another problem here. Let's have a look at this. Turn it on. And I don't even have an input here, okay, right? There are two 5-volt regulators. Remember, we replaced them. <laughs> so this one uh, powers 
the input card and the um, frequency multiplier card. However, it only powers, it only sends the plus five volts if it's not in times one to this card. It's, it always sends it to the uh, input card, okay? So watch what happens when I switch on to a multiplier other than times one. The output of that regulator drops to one and a half volts. Well, this isn't going to work very well on one and a half volts. So I did measure the current draw of this card when it was out of circuit, and it's about 300 milliamps. These regulators can supply up to an amp, and then they have built-in current limiting, which would, which would knock that uh, output voltage down. That tells me that either, one, the voltage regulator is defective, and certainly that's a possibility, although I did test it uh, at a half an amp or two, that the input card is drawing over 700 milliamps, which seems excessive. Um, so we'll have to look into that, uh, but that's gonna be another video.